I certainly want to thank Mark and the Monroeville Library for having me do this program. And as I indicated, I'm, I'm really glad that you guys are either Pirate fans, that you remember that time period, or that you're curious about it. So we'll give you some history and some new information, I hope, today. But I will start with a little quick background about myself. Uh, I was born in Pittsburgh. And so my first breath as a baby infant was back in 1951, when breathing the Pittsburgh air wasn't so good of an idea with the, the pollution. But you know, some people have said that it's the water or the air or both that make Pittsburghers so tough. And then I read Joe Montana kind of jokingly said, it's not just the water, it's the fact that the water is put into the Iron City beer. So the water of the three rivers makes us tough. But you know, just joking, but uh, I, I know another uh, writer had said uh, about my hometown of Denora, Pennsylvania, that uh, it, it produced so many great athletes that he said he was going to take his son, a young boy at the time, uh, to the um, waters, uh, the banks of the Monongahela River, and like Achilles, you know, dip his heel, dip him into the, <laughs> the, the uh, Monongahela to endow him with athletic powers. But uh, Denora really did produce a lot of great athletes, and uh, the sports atmosphere made it a, a, a strong influence on me. Uh, for example, the town has always called itself the home of champions, and it produced Ken Griffey Sr., who I played uh, baseball with, and uh, he and I were in the same class with Denora. And of course, his son is officially from Denora, Pennsylvania. And um, then you've got Stan the Man Musial. In fact, I did a biography. See if you can, it comes out clear, clear there. Uh, boy, what an all time great this guy was, Stan the Man. And so, uh, you know, influenced by the fact that I grew up in Denora, I wrote that, that book on him. Uh, my favorite story from that book uh, is about my father, who lived very close to, to where Stan grew up. And my dad's eight years older than usual. Musial was always looking for a baseball game to play. So he stumbles across my dad, my uncle, and some guys, older guys, playing ball and says, can I play with you guys? And my dad says, you're not good enough, kid. You know, go away, which in hindsight later is just ironic. But he's one of the all-time greats. But um, yeah, I mean, Denar was a big influence. Uh, I remember Musial was the kind of guy that still had strong roots to our hometown. And when he first met and made a point of meeting Junior, Ken Griffey Jr., he, he jokingly said to him, you know, uh, Junior, you're the second best left-handed hitting, left-handed throwing outfielder from Denora, Pennsylvania, who was born on November 21st. That's <laughs> kind of true. Uh, the town also produced a running back who led the league in rushing, Deacon Dan Tyler. And there was a kid who went to West Point, the quarterback, but he was so well-rounded, he set a record for the most letters ever won at uh, West Point. And his name was Arnold, nicknamed Pope Gallipa. So another writer jokes that Denora produced Deacon Dan Tyler, Arnold Pope Gallipa, and with Musial, you had a cardinal. So, so much for that. Uh, my parents were big influence. My mom taught me to love reading and my dad taught me the love of words. So I started writing uh, when I was like six years old. Of course, you can imagine no vocabulary or whatever, but I sold my first book to my dad and been taken off ever since then. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it all led up as far as we're concerned today to this book, uh, 1960, when the Pittsburgh Pirates had them all the way. There's a picture of the, <clears throat> a ball signed by Mazeroski. So I really enjoyed doing this book, uh, but I gotta tell you, you know, the, the 1959 Pirates and the 50s for that matter overall were not uh, very prosperous for the Pirates. They were far from being a contender. Their worst season of that decade was 52. They had, if you want to call it a winning percentage, of 0.312. They couldn't even win a third of their games. They lost 112, and back then they played 154 games. So Joe Garagiola, who was on that team, uh, kind of told a little funny story about Branch Rickey, the general manager. He said he made the Pirates the first team to wear the protective batting helmets. And he joked and said that we didn't really need them because no opposing pitcher is going to say, why do I have to throw at these guys? I'm not going to you know, try to hit a 200 batter. So the, it, was, it was a pathetic team. And in 53, the Pirates were 55 games out of first place. You know, it was in first. We mentioned it, Brooklyn Dodgers. And um, from 52 through 53, these Pirates lost an average of 106 games every year. Now, in 1958, we're getting closer to the book. 58, Murtaugh comes along in his first full season. And he boosted the team to a second place finish. But the next year they slipped to fourth place. So the 1960 version of the Pirates 
kind of a mixed story. Nobody expected a whole lot out of them, but they became a team of destiny. Uh, during the regular season, they won a little bit over 20 games uh, in which they came through and won in their last and bat. And 12 times they won after there were already two outs in their last and bat. They won like 70% of extra inning games. And uh, they again, proved to be a team of fate. And early on that became very evident when on April 17th, the Pirates early in the season are trailing five nothing going into the last half of the ninth inning. And I'm gonna read from the book an excerpt about this miraculous contest. Through eight and a half brutal innings, the Reds had battered five Pirate pitchers for 14 hits and they led five to nothing. A good portion of the 16,000 some fans who had come out to celebrate Easter Sunday with the Pirates had vanished already like chocolate bunny into the mouths of children before the bottom of the ninth. And here's what they missed. With one out, catcher Smokey Burgess, Bill Verdon, and Bill Mazeroski had three straight hits and that brought in one run. Well, no big deal. Hal Smith follows though with a three run homer and that cuts the lead down to one run. And that would wind up being Hal Smith's second most important home run of the year. We'll get to that later when we talk about the series. Uh, Don Hoke then made the second out. So again, uh, the Pirates are down to their last out and the resilient uh, Buckos came through then with a dig road single and Bob Skinner walk off uh, home run. So the Pirates had stormed back with six runs on six hits. And I'm thinking it probably uh, caused Bob Prince to use that famous line of his where he says, you know, we had them all the way, which he would say kind of tongue in cheek in games in which they didn't have them all the way. But I like that. So I used that uh, for the book that I held up for you earlier for the title. Now, utility infielder Dick Schofield told me you could play a thousand games like that one and, and maybe, you know, win one. And I thought that may be true, but the 1960 season was one of a, one of a thousand or one in a thousand uh, kind of a season. Six runs on six hits, nobody left on, and that's it. Uh, they win it. And it was a miraculous comeback. And Skinner, in fact, stated that he thought the win over the Reds that day sort of turned the team around. We went on from there. I don't know if it was a confidence builder, he said, but uh, we were very successful after that. And as I mentioned, logically after a not so hot 1959 season, there was no real reason for optimism, but when you get wins like that one in a thousand game, uh, the faith started to grow. As the comeback wins piled on, uh, the battling bucks started, they really take uh, the concept of we're a team of destiny to heart. And Hal Smith said, as a matter of fact, after the comeback against the Reds, I turned to Bob Skinner and I said, hey, Bob, where do we sign up for our World Series tickets? They laughed, but it turned out to be, you know, true, prophetic. Um, that win that day nudged the Pirates over the break-even mark. They were three and two, eh, still early. But two days later, they began their longest winning streak of the season. They rattled off nine straight wins through May 1st and actually turned out that by and large, the rest of the season was smooth sailing so we're gonna jump now to what I think is the wildest, most lopsided World Series ever and how the Pirates proved again to be a team of fate. <clears throat> I was lopsided because when New York won, they won by huge margins, 16 to three, 12 to nothing and 10 to nothing. By the way, the 12 nothing score is the largest shutout in World Series history. The statistics, New York dominated. They set a ton of records, uh, most runs scored, the shutout, uh, they outhit the Pirates this is as a team, team batting average of 338 to Pittsburgh's 256. If you're into on-base plus slugging, you know that 0.911 for the Yankees is staggering, Pirates at 0.656. They out-homer the Pirates 10 to four, and th get this, they outscored the Pirates 55 to 27, more than doubling the Pirates output, but the Pirates will win. Uh, and that led to a classic line by a Pirate who said, yep, they, they broke all the records and we won the game. He meant game seven, but they, they win it all. And of course they won the winner's share of the, uh, of the pot, which worked out to about $8,400. The Yankees for winning a pennant, about $5,200 a man, which really displays one of the biggest, uh, you know, disparities or contrasts between the game back then and now. $5,200 for winning the pennant, that's chump change as they say. Uh, a rookie nowadays gets a guaranteed minimum salary of more than a hundred times that 5,200 the Yankees got. Uh, they get over $570,000 nowadays just for playing, a, even if you're an unproven rookie. Uh, so in other words, a rookie now gets about $3,500 every game he plays. 
of course, a star player like Mike Trout gets of roughly $200,000 every game. That's, that's incredible to me. So of course the times were different. In 1960, players had to have off season jobs. We mentioned El Roy Face with the carpentry. Um, you know, those guys, uh, you know, in, in their day, not only did they have to work in the off season, but their retirement checks were such they, uh, after hanging up their cleats, were still getting a job. Uh, Gino Samoli, an outfielder, worked uh, driving a UPS truck in San Francisco. And he joked once that he even refused to think about what players got nowadays because he said, if I did, I'd be tempted to leap from the Golden Gate Bridge. Not really, but of course, but, uh, but let's look at some of the salaries. I read that the you know minimum salary was 7,000 back then. In 1960, Bob Friend was said to make between 32 and 42,000. The sources vary. Um, he was the highest played, paid player. Hoke, Law, Verdon, and I believe it was Harvey Haddix were all in the next ballpark, uh, around 25,000. The team captain was Dick Grote. He had signed a $5,000 bonus off the Duke campus, and he never played in the minors. He was going to win the MVP in 60, but he had to play, uh, play the season for uh, not even 20,000. And two future Hall of Famers, that's Mazeroski and Clemente, bargain basement salaries around 17,000 a year. Of course, you know, tickets were a lot cheaper back then. The ballpark uh, was uh, filled with guys like some in the bleachers for a buck. General admission was $1.50 at Forbes. Uh, the reserve seats would cost you $2.50 and the best in the house, the box seats, about $3. So the teams weren't getting uh, rich off, uh, off the gate, so to speak. So now let's take a look at some of the players who made up that team. The starting lineup, basically, uh, they used two catchers, two guys behind the plate, Smokey Burgess and Hal Smith. Smith told me that the catching combination worked, worked very well because he said, quote, between the two of us, we knocked in close to 100 runs. It was 84. He said, I hit 295, Smokey hit 294. I hit 11 home runs and Smokey hit seven. But Smith estimated that of his uh, 11 home runs, nine were game winners. So he really came through. And Smokey Burgess is uh, to this day, one of the greatest pinch hitters uh, ever. He in fact retired holding the record for most pinch, hit, uh, pinch hits. Vernon Law said, I always tell people that Smokey could come uh, to, to the plate in the middle of winter and snows on the ground and you could throw your best fastball to him and he'd drill it for a base hit. Uh, I have a few, just two quick quizzes throughout the, the little talk today. So just, you know, you don't have to shout a lot, but think about it and see if you know the answer to this one. People remember Smokey Burgess, but does anybody know what his real first name was? I'll give you a second or two to think about it. And his first name, a little bit unusual, but there was a football guy named Forrest Gregg that shared that name. He was Forrest, Forrest Burgess. He was 5'8", a bit on the chubby kind of, dumpy side. So teammates called him Spanky, as in Spanky of the Little Rascals. And one writer compared him, quote, to a walking laundry bag. And now, meanwhile, Elroy Face, or Roy Face, felt bad that Smith was really kind of always underappreciated. And, uh, and Face pointed to that unforgettable series home run. Game seven, without Smith, the Pirates don't get the World Series win. Uh, Face told me he hit that three-run homer in the eighth inning. Everybody seems to forget about it. He gets no credit for it. And I think that won the ball game for us more than anything in a way. And Dick Rhodes said that Smith's home run to him was the most underrated one in baseball history. Moving on to first base, that's where you'd find Dick Stewart. He was their primary source of power, but kind of an all or nothing slugger, kind of one dimensional. But despite hitting for power, unlike so many of the Yankees, Stewart wasn't exactly setting any home run records, not like Maris, Mantle, uh, Smith, I'm sorry, uh, Stewart led the Pirates but with only 23 home runs that year. Of course, in the minors, one year he had 66 home runs. And from then on, this guy who had a huge ego uh, took to signing his autograph, Dick Stewart, 66 for those home runs. And he'd add a star to his signature over the eye, uh, the way some young girls sometimes draw a heart or a flower when they sort of dot their eyes. Maz, of course, was stationed at second base. And to this day, Many experts say he is, in fact, the greatest second baseman ever defensively. Now, Johnny O'Brien was with the Pirates when Maz was called up to the majors. O'Brien was very versatile. He said he almost didn't know whether he should consider himself a second baseman, shortstop, or even a pitcher, and he did pitch in the bigs. 
he told me I'd go to the ballpark and I didn't know what I was going to do that day. But I remember when they brought Maz up to the majors, he said, I watched him for about 10 minutes and I said, I am now a utility infielder. He knew he couldn't beat on Maz. Now, everybody would marvel at Maz's defensive talent. They say that some hitters back in the 50s uh, would, would actually stop what they were doing to watch Ted Williams take batting practice. And that's, a, that's a, quite a compliment. Well, before the start of the 1958 All-Star Game, American League uh, players who aren't used to seeing Maz actually halted their activities to watch Mazeroski take ground balls, to watch him take infield. There is a famous quote about Willie Mays. They say his glove is where triples went to die. And to me, Mazeroski's glove is where singles were turned into double plays. And his, uh, his double play teammate or, or a double play duo uh, was made uh, up with Dick Rowe. He won the 60 MVP I mentioned, but if a 1959 trade had been pulled off, Grote wouldn't have not only, not only not have been a pirate, he would have been in the American League, not the National League. He wouldn't win the MVP. You see the Pirates and the Kansas City Athletics came very close to consummating a deal which would have been Dick Grote going to Kansas City for Roger Maris. But Danny Murtaugh and the general manager, Joe Brown, reconsidered last minute, they say no. Maris, a couple of days later, gets traded to the Yankees. So it's kind of weird that the two guys who wind up MVPs in 60 almost got traded for one another. Um, Warren Spahn quoted, was quoted as saying he thought that Grote was the one player Pittsburgh could not do without. And he kind of proved that when he led the league hitting 325. Uh, Pittsburghers probably know this, but I'll get, give you a real quick look at uh, his basketball career. He was the first man, Grote, to get inducted into both the college uh, baseball and basketball halls of fame, two-time All-American guard at Duke, first player at Duke to have his number retired, his number jersey up in the rafters. He had a single game high once of 48 points. That was a Duke record that stood for about 40 years. And he once held the record for most points scored in a season, NCAA season. Played briefly in the NBA. And of course, you know, he was a broadcaster working the pit basketball games for many, many years. Another kind of instance of destiny stepping in. Grote, a key player, got hurt down the 1960 stretch run. And there's a chance the Pirates don't win the pennant if it weren't for utility infielder Dick Schofield. Uh, he was definitely a... Um, unlikely hero, a man who entered the start of 60 uh, with a lifetime batting average of 196, and he only wound up with an average of 227. But despite that, filling in for Grote, who had broken his wrist in early, um, early September, Schofield hit a sensational 414 down the stretch, which, you know, is pretty good for a guy who had to be rusty. Uh, up until the Grote injury, he had played only two games at shortstop and only 13 games in all. But boy, he came off the bench and you might know that he is the father of a big leaguer also named Dick, and his grandson is a guy named Jason Worth, who was an all-star all -star outfielder. By way of contrast, his grandson winds up earning $136 million for his career. Uh, the best Schofield could ever earn for one season was 32,000, big difference. Uh, a trivia note, uh, in addition to Schofield having a son who grows up to become a major leaguer, Four other players in the 1960 series produced big league sons. A pitcher named Fred Green, Bob Skinner had a son who became a big leaguer. Uh, the same with Vernon Law and Yogi Berra, his son Dale. Okay, let's move to third base. Don Hoke, he truly was a, a tiger of a guy, an ex-Marine and an ex-prize fighter who broke his nose eight times, but he was the club leader. He was very gutsy. Uh, interesting story, one year he played winter ball in Cuba where the games were wild and raucous. There were protesting college students uh, that would interrupt games. And one game was disrupted when a guy comes out of the stands, hops onto the field, <clears throat> strolls out to the pitcher's mound and demands the baseball, says, I'm gonna pitch. And they let him. Uh, at the plate was Hoke. And the pitcher, by the way, was Fidel Castro. He was wild. A few pitches came really close to, to, to knocking down uh, Hoke. So Hoke says, you know, that's it. The farce is over, forget it. But later Hoke jokes and says, you know, with a little work on his control, Castro would have made a better pitcher than a prime minister. Hoke was pretty clever too. In one game, he was on first base when a ground ball is hit, I think at the second baseman. And it comes pretty close to Hoke who realizes 
you know what, this is going to be a double play. I think I'm going to grab the ball. He bends over, stops the ball, picks it up, and then I think he just sort of dropped it. And uh, so the fielder can't turn a double play. Uh, the umpire says, you can't do that. You're out for interference. And Hoke's thinking, I'm out, but that saved another out. So no double play. The rules were changed after that, but a pretty clever guy. In left field was another ex-Marine, Bob Skinner. Kind of quiet, don't have a lot on him. Likeable guy, worked hard. Vernon Law told me that with Verdon and Clemente out there with him, uh, he, you know, Skinner and the other two outfielders, he thought had like one of the best outfields of the era. Next, counting this guy's time as a player, manager, or coach, Bill Verdon spent, and I found this amazing, more than 60 spring trainings in a fired uniform. He and Maz led the way in the series with five RBIs, uh, but it was his glove work that really stood out. And a lot of people felt that defensively only, he was comparable to Willie Mays. Hal Smith said that Verdon was fast, an excellent outfielder, good arm, accurate. And Ken Griffey said, uh, yeah, he was good. And boy, he covered a lot of ground in center field. Now there's a baseball expert named Bill James, who actually said, if you look at Bill Verdon's batting averages over his first two seasons, uh, he had the ability to become a, a very good hitter instead of marginal hitter. But uh, Verdon began to have problems with his vision. And in fact, uh, he was one of not too many uh, baseball players who wore glasses. Ironically, Verdon originally was with the Yankees, a team he then helped to defeat with some sparkling plays in 1960. Now, right field, of course, belonged to Roberto Clemente and what an arm he had. But the th thing is, a lot of people don't know this, I didn't, um, even in junior high, he showed his arm off and on the mound, he was his team's pitching star way back when. Uh, of course, he went on to show that arm again and again only two outfielders in the history of baseball have ever won a dozen uh, gold glove awards, and that's Mays and Clemente. Um, and then as, a, as far as a hitter goes, it was written that Clemente could hit any pitch, and the quote was, from the bill of his hat down to his shoelaces. And he once said, you pitch me outside, I'll hit 400. Pitch me inside, you won't find the ball. And I remember interviewing Steve Blass, who told me a similar story. He said, I went up to Clemente one time, and I said, listen, if you ever get traded, I'm going to pitch you inside because every National League pitcher pitches you away and you hit 350 every year. And Clemente looks at Blast and he says, Blast, I'm going to tell you one thing. You pitch me inside and I'll hit the ball to Harrisburg, which I kind of like. Um, some people complained that Clemente worried about his health too much. Some said he was a hypochondriac. Uh, you remember how he entered the batter's box before he would dig in and sort of twist and crane his neck? It kind of reminded me like the Linda Blair and the Exorcist. But Gene Klein said, he was no hypochondriac. He had legitimate issues. And then he added, <clears throat> whenever Clemente came in the clubhouse and said he felt good, he would have a bad game. When he complained, my neck's hurt, neck hurts or my kids kept me up all night, he'd have a great game. Let's move on to the pitchers. The ace of the staff was, of course, the 20-game winner, the Cy Young Award winner, Vern Law. But going into the year, he was ranked only as their third best pitcher. The thing I liked about Law uh, among others, is he was so cooperative. He was about, I think he was 88 years old when I interviewed him a couple of years ago. And, you know, we're doing this phone interview for an hour, hour and a half. And a couple of times I said to him, you know, you want to stop, take a break. I'll call you back another day. No, no, I like talking about the past. And it seems true. I, I, I frankly prefer talking to the old timers than to the current players. Now, Law <clears throat> was a great guy by all accounts and a devout Mormon, which is how he got the nickname Deacon. In fact, they told me that out of respect for him, uh, none of the teammates would swear around him. Uh, law is just uh, full of uh, trivia items. Uh, there are items like uh, little trivia things like he and his wife, Vanita, had six children and all the people in the family had names, first names, which started with letter V. Uh, another trivia thing, one time he pitched 18 innings of a 19 inning game and he lost when the new guy comes in, the reliever, and gave up a run pretty quickly. But you know, just imagine what his pitch count would have been and how you'll never see something like that again. Uh, another bit of baseball lore, uh, it's, it's been said that Bing Crosby, who owned a small slice of the Pirates, was influential in persuading Vernon Law's mom to have her son sign with the Pirates. She loved his singing, so the Pirates had Bing give her a call to convince her to let her son sign with the Pirates. And they say, don't know if it's true, but to convince her that it was really me, Bing Crosby, 
Uh, he broke into a little bars of White Christmas and uh, and he signs with the Pirates. And in fact, he nearly won three games in the World Series, which was a record. Um, and the thing that gets me, it's a big coincidence I stumbled across. Vernon Law's nickname is Deacon. Well, the first man ever to win three games in a World Series was a guy named Deacon, I think it's pronounced Philippi. And the funny thing is, Philippi has not only the same nickname as, as, um, as Vernon Law Deacon, but uh, he not only you know, wins it in the first uh, World Series ever, 1903, but it turns out he's a distant relative of the actor who's around nowadays, uh, whose name is Ryan Philippi. And by the way, he named his son Deacon. Last trivia note about Vernon Law. It's kind of amazing that he was able to win two World Series games because on the team bus, the night that the Pirates clinched the, uh, the pennant, uh, the players were horsing around. They were cutting other players' neckties off, ripping their shirts, uh, you know, making the buttons come off and so on. And one player tried to twist uh, Vernon Law's shoe off. And in doing so, he hurt his ankle, which he then begins to favor. And he told me that later, because of that, he tore his rotator. So to win the, and, and pitch as well as he did in the series was, was pretty amazing. Now, here's something Sharon will like. It's about Roy Face. Uh, he was nicknamed the Baron of the Bullpen, and without him, who knows where the Pirates finish. I got to believe second, third, fourth, I don't know. Uh, it was small, but sensational. I looked this up, and it was, uh, to me, it was uh, incredible. There have been just seven pitchers who stood under 5'9 since the end of World War II to make it to the majors long enough to last like 100 games. And no pitcher that size has done it since 1976. But Face did. He was 5'8", and he told me he concluded several seasons worn out to the point where he was 146 pounds in the major leagues, but he made it, made it big. And ironically, like Bill Burton, he might have been with the Yankees instead of the Pirates because New York scouts looked at him, they evaluated him, and they said, eh, he's too small. Okay. Well, his best pitch was a fork ball, which dropped out of the strike zone, a sunk like a spitball or a split finger fastball. And in fact, somebody once asked him, what was the difference between your fork ball and the modern you know, split finger fastball? He replied, the difference was about a million dollars, which gets back to the, to the salary aspect again. Now, Bob Oldis was a pirate catcher. He said of face, quote, he was determined when he came into the game, wrap it up, boys, it's all over. And to this day, face holds the record for the highest winning percentage in a season. Uh, you might remember in 1959, he won 18 and lost only one game, meaning he won like 95% of his decisions and he still holds the, um, the career record for the Pirates for uh, saves, not Kent Tocqueville as some people think. Now, unlike today's closers who typically work the ninth inning only, Face frequently threw several innings and um, he often took the hill, the mound in the middle of an inning with his team in a pretty bad jam, maybe bases loaded. In 1960, uh, he, he worked many of his games um, when there were guys in scoring position. And it, to me, there's no wonder back then these pitchers were called firemen. Uh, one final member of the team I'd like to discuss who never threw a pitch, never swung a bat, was the Hall of Fame broadcaster, Bob Prince. In, uh, in case you're familiar with him and his work, here's my last little quiz. I'm going to give you a name of a pirate. And typically, uh, the nickname Prince gave to them was that of, a, of an animal. So again, I'll give you the answers, but think about it. Do you remember uh, the nickname of Hoke at third base? And if you said to yourself, Tiger, that's right. Center field, Verdon. He was nicknamed the quail for some reason. Skinner in left field was the dog or doggy sometimes. And Haddix, who was a tiny kind of a guy, earned the nickname of the kitten. Um, Prince even gave his broadcasting buddy, Jim Woods, the name the Possum. Um, okay, so that's about it for profiles. Let's take a look at the actual World Series. A lot of people forget that Mazeroski actually had a game-winning home run, not just in Game 7, but in Game 1 as well. It only put the Pirates up by one run. It was early in the game, but it, that run held up, and the Pirates win Game 1, 5-4. to four. I think it was interesting that Maz winds up hitting as many or more home runs than everybody in the World Series, except Mickey Mantle. Now, game two rolls around, and after losing game one, the Yankees bounce back with that 16-3 shellacking of the Pirates. 
but the most important thing that happened in game uh, games one and two is what many Yankees and Pirates believe is the case, and that is that uh, Yankee manager Casey Stengel blew it. They feel he should have started Whitey Ford, the ace, in game one, which would have give, given him three starts instead of he was limited to two. Uh, Ford had already won his last three games. He was well rested. And, uh, you know, Stengel waits until game three to start him, uh, even though he, again, he's the ace. Bobby Richardson of the Yankees told me he believes if Ford had worked game one, he would have done what he did in the other two games, which was win and win by shutouts. So if Ford would have won the first game and three overall, well, that changes the entire complexion of the series. And Vernon Law kind of summed it up by very uh, unabashedly, you know, right out saying, I will say this, quote, the Pirates on the Yankee team did not lose the series. It was Casey Stengel. He said Ford could dominate you. That's why he was called the chairman of the board. Stengel made some other questionable moves which supported what Law said about him. Uh, for example, the Yankees were down late in the game, game seven, by a run. And a slow runner reaches first base and he represents the tying run in this all important game, <clears throat> but he does not pinch run for this guy until he reaches third, not even when he reached second base scoring position. So many people suggested that old age had caught up with Stengel. And I was told that he sometimes during the regular season fell asleep on the bench during games. Now in the crucial ninth inning of game seven, scores tied, Maz is gonna make history. He leads off the inning, Stengel goes to the bullpen and calls upon pitcher Ralph Terry. He could have gone with Whitey Ford out of the bullpen. And if someone argues, well, Ford had just worked the game before, pitched 114 pitches, then that's another wrap on Stengel because he could have yanked uh, Whitey Ford from game seven uh, as early as say the sixth inning and rest him a little bit because he was winning easily in game six. But instead of having Ford on the mound, Terry, and again, history is made. Getting back to the idea of destiny, uh, the World Series contained quite a few odd plays and all of them seemed to go the Pirates way, or almost. Uh, the Pirates already thought they were a team of destiny thanks to those comebacks. And look at what happens. In the eighth inning of the final game, Bill Verdon hit what should have been a tailor-made, you know, routine double play ball. It takes this weird hop that the players say, unexpected, it, it never happens. It hits Tony Kubik at shortstop right in his throat, he keels over, they don't get anybody. Uh, so instead of nobody on base and two men out, the Pirates get a reprieve and they score five runs with the, the help of fate. And Vernon Law pointed out another odd event that happened just a couple of batters later. He said, Roberto hit one off the end of the bat and instead of the pitcher, Jim Coates, running over to cover first base, which they're trained to do over and over, he hesitates, doesn't, uh, well, he starts to chase the ball down, nobody covers first. Clemente not only beats it out, but uh, scouring at first base, Moose eats the ball and the Yankees find that their lead is now dwindled to seven to six. And years later, Mickey Mantle said, and this is a quote, right then and then, then and there, Casey should have pulled Coates from the game. The situation demanded it. He was fidgeting. You don't let that man pitch, but Stengel does. If Coates had covered, again, the inning's over. Instead, they not only caught up to the Yankees soon, uh, but very shortly took the lead when Hal Smith hit what I mentioned earlier was that monumental home run. Uh, and, and otherwise, Smith leads off the ninth inning and nobody's on base, but he hits the three-run homer. Uh, and the funny thing, too, Hal Smith shouldn't even been in the game, you could argue. See, earlier in the ball game, Smokey Burgess hits what was a, turns out to be a meaningless single. But because he is so slow, Murtaugh says, I'm going to pinch run for him just in case. And that's what causes Smith to be uh, placed into the lineup. So he easily could have been on the bench instead of behind the plate, uh, but he's out there and hits that home run. And the Yankees were loaded too with talent. You know, sluggers, Roger Maris, a couple of Hall of Famers in Mantle, uh, and Yogi Berra and a pitcher, Hall of Famer, uh, Roddy Ford. And their slugging did come through, but in game seven, not enough. So what they hoped would be their fourth win to wrap it up in the series finale it's ironic that the Yankees lose because the Pirates stole the Yankees' main weapon, their favorite weapon, winning on those two home runs, Smith and Maz. And again, Maz is far from being a power hitter. He only hit 11 all season long, uh, but then he wins two games with homers over two out of seven games. And by the way, 
again, the Pirates not slugging in, uh, at all. The gap between Maz's first home run in the game in game number one and the next Pirate home run, which didn't come until the finale, that gap was almost 50 innings, almost 50 innings without a home run. The dry spell ended, though, with those three home runs in all, and they win game seven, which, by the way, is the only postseason game ever with no strikeouts, and that record is probably never going to be broken. Uh, so this uh, World Series uh, is strange. I mean, it's also the only one where the MVP award winner is from the losing team. That was Yankee uh, Bobby Richardson. This guy has 26 runs batted in all year in 150 games. And then in seven games, he drives in almost half that many, 12 in just seven games. And Richardson confessed. He said, you know, I was surprised to hear I was the MVP. Uh, he kind of attributed to the fact that the voting was concluded before Mazeroski's homer. So many people think Maz was robbed of that award. And actually, Elroy Face says, in a way, I could have, uh, I did deserve the MVP uh, in, in many respects. Uh, he tells me that he had three saves. He said that's the first guy to ever do that in a World Series. And he would have been the winning pitcher in game uh, seven until the Pirates uh, bullpen again blew a lead that they had blown earlier for, for long. Faye said, yes, Richardson drove in six runs in one game for a record and 12 overall, which was a record, but they didn't win. History was also made that day back in 60 with an enduring record that uh, many P Pittsburgh people know, and that is the home run mass hits in game seven, and there's that statue to commemorate it, the only walk off game seven home run, uh, you know, winning the whole series ever. In the clubhouse after the seventh game, uh, the Yankees took it hard. Mantle was sobbing openly because he felt, uh, I've been in a lot of World Series and we really should have won this one. And in many ways, he's right. Uh, he thought they were superior to the Pirates, not so sure about that. But the Yankees had six of their 10 players who eventually are, uh, you know, honored by having their uniform numbers retired, six players on this 1960 team and members on the 60 Yankees had accounted for seven of the last 11 American League MVP awards. So that, that was loaded with talent. Bottom line though, as Barris told uh, Maris after that game, he said, you know, we just got beat Roger by the damnedest baseball team that me or you or anybody else ever played against. And you could certainly argue he was right. A few days after the World Series, Casey Snagel fired. The front office tried to say his dismissal was because he was too old. And uh, Stengel kind of bitterly says, well, maybe, but I'll never make the mistake of being 70 years old again. So much for that. When the season's MVP award uh, ceremony, I'm so, not sorry, the, the announcement was made, uh, Clemente was upset. He was upset because, you know, he's a proud guy and he thought he didn't get enough respect from the voters. I think he's probably right because, uh, you know, not only doesn't he win the award and it was, it was great that year, but he finishes a distant eighth in the voting. Um, okay, so at this point, I'd like to conclude with a few more stories about the 60 Pirates, but this time about the, the colorful guys, which leads to a, another book. Let me see if we can get that on there. This book is uh, called Wits, Flakes, and Clowns. I really love doing this book, as you can see from the cover. There's Casey Stengel, uh, Tug McGraw being silly with that submarine sandwich there, whatever. Uh, so it is about, as it says at the top, the colorful characters of baseball. And the Pirates certainly had some. I'll start with Dick Stewart, who was, in fact, a notoriously poor defensive first baseman. Probably the most famous story about him was during a game on a very blustery day, a hot dog wrapper kind of skitters across the infield, and um, he, he snags it. And suddenly there's an ovation from the crowds, maybe uh, half good natured, half sarcastic, uh, as if the audience was saying, well, you finally caught something. Now, Roy Face had a very crisp, effective throw to first base. He'd throw over hard on pickoffs. Uh, Schofield said, one time Stewart goes to the mound and he actually says to Face, now don't go throwing the ball over here real hard because I might miss it. And I'm thinking, imagine a big leaguer afraid of the ball, but that's not the only time he avoided the baseball. Uh, he, he truly earned his nicknames. I mean, in Boston, they called him the Boston Strangler because he would just strangle the ball or butcher it. He was called the man with the iron glove, but most famously, Dr. Strange Glove. One time uh, in a game against the Dodgers, a ball was hit near Dick Road at shortstop. 
And Stewart was convinced the ball was headed into the outfield. So he's not even paying attention. He had been jawing, arguing with the guys in the Dodger dugout near first base. And when he's convinced the ball is a base hit to the outfield, he turns around and keeps arguing with some Dodgers and the ball comes whizzing right by his face. Grote had made the play and he figures, I can throw to first. He's going to pay attention, not Stewart. As I said, he, he really tried to avoid the ball at all times. And Steve Blass told a story about a lucky, how lucky Stewart was to play next to that great defensive glove, Bill Mazeroski. When a pop-up was hit anywhere on the right side of the diamond near Stewart, instead of shouting out the usual, I got it, I got it, or mine, Stewart would yell out, plenty of room, Maz, or all yours, Maz. He, he wanted him to take it. Um, next, the guy who was pretty, pretty colorful, I thought, was Hal Smith. A trivia thing about him, he came up in the Yankee system, another one of those guys, and he was with him until he got involved in a 17-player trade. I don't know when that'll happen again. But he had this subtle, good sense of humor. And maybe to me that made kind of sense because uh, he has actually the same name, Hal Smith, as an actor who played Otis Campbell, the town drunk, on The Andy Griffith Show. So one day a former player, uh, Carl Warwick, runs into Hal Smith years after Smith's big home run in the World Series. And he kind of teasingly says to him, he says, oh, Hal, you don't ever think about the fact that Maz hit that big home run after you had hit your key home run. Smith kind of understated and said, I think about it every once in a while. You bet he did. Um, when, it, when a name from his uh, playing days would escape him, because I mean, he was 80 some when I interviewed him, he kind of explained it by saying, well, that was a long time ago and I had a lot of operations. As a catcher, I took a few many foul tips off my head, just joking about it. The last guy is the colorful Bob Prince, nicknamed the gunner, as I said, for his uh, rapid fire sort of staccato broadcast delivery. He was famous for wearing outrageous gaudy sports jackets. He was kind of a wild guy at times. And I think one of the craziest things he ever did was written about by Myron Cope, I think in a magazine article. It was about the time uh, Prince accepted a $20 bet from Gene Freeze, who was taunting, teasing him. To me, Prince was, uh, in this instance, sort of like the kid Flick from the Christmas story of the movie. So Prince gives in to a triple dog dare and he wins this wager for 20 bucks by jumping into a, the hotel swimming pool from the third story windowsill of his room. Now Prince had been on the uh, pit swim team, but he had to launch himself out far enough from his window to clear roughly 10 feet of concrete that surrounded the pool. One source said he barely missed getting pulverized, but he insisted, of course, not he made it easily. Uh, Prince was very capable of turning guys into wrecks and once almost literally did that. He was making a trip by airplane uh, with a pirate publicist named Jack Berger. Prince was about to do a speaking engagement, so they chartered this airplane. Now, Prince had some uh, flying lessons, some hours under his belt to his credit, but he had no pilot's license at that time, but that doesn't stop him, kind of a wild guy, uh, from asking the pilot if he could take over, take the stick for a little bit, and he did, he did okay. Then, uh, the opposite of how I would behave or you would behave, he spots a small storm center that's out of their flight pattern, but says to the pilot, why don't we fly through that storm? And they did, according to the story, he flew through the storm without incident, but then Prince ups the ante and it terrified the publicist by, according to Cope, decided, deciding to fly the aircraft upside down. I'm not sure I'd believe that story, but uh, they say that later on, Prince asked permission of the pilot to land the plane, and he supposedly did so on this strip, airstrip that was uh, near the side of a mountain and across a river. And it was a strip that was just a few feet above the level of the water. So I'm told it was a challenging landing. When they finally came to a halt, Prince announced, like real blase, real casual, you know, that's the first time I ever landed a plane. So if it's a true story, um, you can imagine. And they say, of course, that the, uh, the passenger, Berger, made the return trip to Pittsburgh by bus. Prince uh, was so colorful, as I mentioned in the book I wrote, uh, he would always come up with gimmicks, and many to prod the pirate fans into rooting for the, for the team, for the pirates. Uh, you remember when he had babushka power? It was a fad where Prince kind of bestowed these magical, mystical powers on the folded kerchiefs and many women would wear, you know, cover their heads up. And he would tell the women to wave that garment, the babushkas, in order to start a pirate rally. 
Uh, ultimately, the fad, I think, uh, seemingly gave birth to uh, Myron Cope's terrible towel, which you know was a similar type of uh, tool for cheerleading uh, for the Pir uh, for the Steelers. In the 60s, after the 1960 World Series, you know, a couple years later, Prince unveiled the green wing. And if you're a Pittsburgher, you might remember uh, this was a little instrument. Uh, at the right moment, Prince would instruct the Forbes Field fans to jinx the opposition by shaking this little, actually it was like a piece of plastic, uh, green pickle shaped, and housed little pellets. So basically it was sort of like a baby rattle, baby's rattle, and he would you know, have them uh, do that to cheer on the, the Pirates. He came up with a lot of clever phrases and comments. He compared Mazeroski and his glove to a vacuum, uh, Hoover vacuum cleaner, if you remember that. Uh, ground ball on the AstroTurf of uh, Three Rivers. He'd say bug got loose on the rug. He called Forbes Field the house of thrills. Hoping for a rally, he would, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, use one of his lines. We just need a bloop and a blast. And after a pirate homer, he would often shout, you can kiss it goodbye. Uh, when something went right, he'd comment something like, how sweet it is. On close plays, I can remember there'd be a ball hit and it would barely miss a foul pole. He'd say the ball was fouled by a Matt's eyelash. Bang, bang, you know, close play at first base was described as being as close as the fuzz on a tick's ear. Very colorful. And a pop-up that was hit high, high in the infield, like maybe one Bob Robertson would hit. We had to call that a home run in an elevator shaft. A lot of people nowadays forget, uh, but early on in his career, Prince wasn't real, real popular, not first. And he knew then that his style irritated many listeners. There was a time, for example, when he excused himself from the dinner table, telling the people gathered around the table, well, I got to leave now, I got to go to the radio booth, a million people are waiting to turn me off. So much for Prince. And in fact, that's about it. Uh, you know, I would tell you that Oh, I should mention this book too. It just came out last year. Uh, it's called Name That Ball Player. It's just a fun quiz book. And I was mentioning before the uh, before we actually formally began talking that I'm working on a, a trivia book now. Many names from past and present, from Johnny Padres to uh, some of the Pirates and so on. But I would say to you that if you'd like to get a copy of any of my books, uh, they're all available on uh, websites like Amazon. Uh, some of the books available on Barnes and Noble, but Amazon for sure. If by any chance you'd like to buy a book for a gift and have me maybe sign it or personalize a message like Happy Father's Day or Merry Christmas to Dad or, or anything like that and add your name like from so-and-so, you can buy your books directly from me, but it's easier online. Uh, it probably even costs you a little less online. But if you really would like that personalized message, I'll give you my email address and you can contact me directly. So if you need it, Got paper, pencil. I'll give it to you in one second. And then we'll close with, uh, if you have any memories uh, you'd like to share or have any questions for me, because it was a lot of fun talking to these guys. I spoke to virtually every living pirate and enjoyed every single interview. Some of the guys, Schofield, Law, uh, exceedingly uh, friendly, cooperative, and what have you. So here is that email address in case you're interested. <clears throat> it's basically my first initial, W for Wayne. So it's W. Then my last name, Stewart, which I spell S T E W A R T, W Stewart 144 at gmail.com. So one more time, W, then S T E W A R T 144, the numerals 144 at gmail.com. So yeah, let's open it up now if anybody has anything they'd like to share, memories, or, um, or any questions. I don't know um, if in, if many folks had a chance to see, but the Heinz History Museum has uh, their entire second floor is all local sports, and they have a lovely section dedicated to the sixty Pirates and a nice little um, tribute to Bob Prince in a little corner. You almost have to go out of your way to find it, but a nice little setup and some audio broadcasts of him that you can listen to. They did a nice job with that. Yeah, I, I know the guy, one of the guys who works there, and he's written some great books on Kennywood, and. Um, they actually, in the fall issue of their uh, the magazine, the publication they put out, they, they featured the 1960 parts. So I believe, yeah, Roy Face is on the front cover. They actually used a, a little article that I had written and, and showed the book cover of my book. But the other guys that wrote articles for that, uh, that publication did a great job as well. 
and boy, you're right. That's a that that's just a great place to visit for everything. But uh, I mean, I don't know if it's still there, but in the lobby, there's a, a couple of cars from I believe it was the Jackrabbit and all kind of great stuff there. So you're right, Sharon. Uh, it was there on Valentine's Day, which is the weekend that I went down there, and there was, um, that was there, there was an old Pittsburgh trolley car, working trolley car yeah. still there, with a little memorabilia about that, they, um, yeah, they did a great job, and with the social distancing, you could take all the time you wanted, and nothing was crowded, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's really worth seeing, they did a nice job. Yep, and you know, I grew up loving Kennywood, so that, I think, it's his name, Mr. Butko, B-U-T-K-O, I believe, but yeah, that's a great place. Um, could you say, could you um, talk a little about Danny Murtaugh? Because he was the manager in two World Series winning teams, one of which I remember mm -hmm. personally, the other one was right before I was born. Um, the uh, 60 and 71, he managed both of those teams. Yeah, he was hired, I believe it was four times in all. I think the third time he left because of his health, but then they, I think, kind of coaxed him out of retirement. And everybody I spoke to said positive things about him including the fact that he pretty much left you alone as long as you were doing your job. Uh, he was no patsy or pushover, but, uh, you know, those players were you know, pretty well behaved and they did their job. So he, he probably had very little reason to chastise. But I believe, if I recall, one of the players says if he did, uh, he would take in his, in his uh, office. He wouldn't shoot you out in front of other players. And back then, it was not uncommon to, to ream a guy in front of others or you know, I'm the manager and you'll do it my way. So not a lot of praise for Murtaugh. Now, if I'm not mistaken, he and Joe Brown, the general manager, were together in New Orleans. So they knew a lot of these guys coming up. And uh, a lot of people forget that, uh, although we mentioned it in this speech, that uh, the general manager before uh, Brown was Branch Rickey. So he's a legend. So things came to fruition by uh, 1960. The thing that puzzled me was, uh, because I have a lot of respect for Murtaugh too, but after 60, they, uh, they just didn't really, uh, you know, put it together again, as some teams do for two, three years in a row or whatever. Uh, but eventually, yeah, Murtaugh comes back again. And of course, people, I think, still have a lot of respect for Chuck Tanner. I want to ask you, uh, Ranch Rickey was forced out of Brooklyn, the ownership, and then he came to Pittsburgh. Was he, I'm not too sure of this, would you say he was responsible for building this championship team or yeah when I when I heard from players and I you know I wasn't on the scene but I certainly agree with them is that, that it's a combination uh, branch Ricky laid the groundworks and so many times you'll see that a manager in, in, in baseball or a, a coach in football will have a, a pretty good team but they underperform or something and they're fired and then these young kids gel and come together and win and the new guy gets all the credit but branch Ricky definitely laid the groundwork. And then Joe Brown gets a lot of credit because he acquired people like, off the top of my head, I think he got uh, uh, Bill Verdon, I believe. Uh, he acquired Harvey Haddix. Um, let me think who else. Um, there were several trades he engineered to get some of these. Bill Verdon, of course, came from another organization, Hal Smith. And the thing too is um, about Branch Rickey, the story I heard was having been with the Dodgers, he knew about Roberto Clemente who was playing in Montreal. So it was no surprise to him to, to know that Clemente was great. And he kind of uh, behind the scenes was able to, to get Clemente from the Dodgers organization. Clemente did have a great season that year. Um, he hit over 300. I think he hit about 16 home runs and all you know, 90 some RBIs. Um, so I can see why he would have been a little bit miffed at only placing eighth in the MVP. How did he do in the series? I mean, he, he was a star in the 1971 series. He, he led, the, led the team. Mm -hmm. How did he do in, six, in this 1960 series? Well, first of all, uh, your question is great because it ties in with something um, people talked about. And it's in the book, but I you know, can't cover everything to talk. But he, one national writer said something like, it only, only took Clemente I forget what he said, 11 years to become a national sensation when he's not an overnight sensation. He was good all around uh, for many, many years, but it did take that showcase against the Orioles. Now, to answer your question directly, um, Clemente is one of those guys that strung together a really long hitting streak because he not only hit safely in all seven games against the Orioles, but yes, he was uh, hit safely in all seven against the Yankees 
So yeah, he was a proud guy and uh, finishing eighth in the voting did uh, irk or irritate him. Maya, hello? Yep. Wayne, okay, I didn't know if I was uh, on mute. Oh, you're good. No, I really enjoyed your talk. I heard things I had never heard before in my life, uh, the, the things about Elroy Face. I never realized he was that small, really. So I had met him years and years ago. Oh, I didn't wow. think he was even that small. But uh, but uh, I um, I was six years old at the time, and all I remember was jumping up and down. I had no mm -hmm. idea, and I became a Pirate fan immediately after that, starting <laughs> six one basically. And I'm, I'm still a, a big, big baseball fan in, in a place where it, football is crazy here. You know, Pittsburgh right. is still a football town. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's just uh, uh, hopefully it'll happen again for the Pirates. I don't know if it'll, hopefully I'm, 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 a, I'm an optimist. So, uh, but mm -hmm. the, under the way things that are going here, hopefully, uh, I don't know, a couple of years down the road, hopefully it'll be improved and we'll see. But uh, but it was very interesting uh, how you dissected this, this team. And uh, my one question was, I don't know if, uh, if you mentioned it or not, I went away from the room, but didn't Clemente criticize, uh, I don't know if he criticized in the press about not being honored that year for MVP. Is that true? I mean, and, and I don't know if he actually intimated about Dick Roach. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I've heard that too. Yeah, I've heard it too. And, uh, you know, it's hard with this sort of ancient history to pinpoint and prove anything. But I think Vernon Law did, did express some, uh, when, I, when I spoke to him, uh, a little bit of dismay about, uh, you know, did Clemente, um, you know, complain about not winning it, that he deserved it? Or was he simply saying, I'm proud and I do deserve more than eighth place, place voting? So you will definitely hear people say that, um, you know, that he didn't take part in the celebration at the Webster Hotel after the World Series. Oh, really? I didn't, oh, wow. Well. But other people say, don't judge, because after the uh, game seven was over, he went into Shenley Park, I'm told, and celebrated with fans. And he did have, I, I heard, uh, you know, tickets to fly back to Puerto Rico that night. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say whether he deserves any criticism or none at all. But you'll hear these stories. And I thought your story was interesting because, boy, when you're young and you get to meet a guy uh, like Elroy Face or whoever, uh, it, it leaves a lasting impression. And I also get a little bit irritated more than a little bit with, uh, with some Yankee fans because, you know, if they don't win a World Series every year, they feel so entitled. It's like, oh, it's, it's not fair. And, you know, and, and two, the media, especially in New York, they act like anything we do is important. And uh, if you're on the peripheral like uh, Pittsburgh, for example, so many times you'll hear that Bobby Thompson's home run in 1951 to win the pennant was the ultimate home run. I'm thinking, how about winning a World Series with one swing as the only walk-off ever? Maz's home run isn't more important than Thompson? Give Thompson his due, but Mazeroski's right. home run, gee whiz. Well, that's the yeah. New York market. That's the New York market, yes. I, I don't know why we saw it, uh, fall into a step behind that, though. Where the rest of the country could say, you might have more writers, a bigger population, but Maz's home run's more important. and. Uh, and you know the, the small market versus large is just un, unfair. It's not a play level playing field. You know the Yankees have that uh, YES, uh, I guess it's called, that system of cable, and and their the profits they make from a, their broadcast compared to what Pittsburgh earns. That's why it's so tough. My son always says we should have the salary cap like in some other sports, and make it a little bit more equitable and fair for a team like Pittsburgh. You remember yeah. when they went 22 years without the uh, winning season, but then how? joyful it was when they made the playoffs but you know and, they, and then they get up against Madison Bumgarner and stuff like that so yeah, it's I not mean, impossible it's not impossible to pull this off again but it, you right. got to have air you know they had uh, career years from uh, Liriano Burnett I mean and things uh, just went into place that year between 2013 to 15 and you just wonder if it'll ever happen again but uh, yeah. that's uh, 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 you know that's another day basically i'm sure you <laughs> and you do you come back to pittsburgh often then i mean i didn't hear a... well i'm old enough now where most of my family has passed away but in fact we're going there next week uh, because i have a couple of in-laws so we go oh. back to wexford cranberry area but i don't get back to denar very often now oh, Denor, yeah right not, not too often 
But October 13th, you're going to come back one of these, right. one of these October 13th. So that, I should go to one of those. I oh, it's fantastic. I've been to three or four of them. Really? It's you fantastic. Know, oh, yeah. Um, if the weather, if weather permitting, I mean. Yeah. And the COVID, I guess last year they didn't do it, right? Correct. Uh, um, I'm trying to think how they did it. Uh, yeah, they did not do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And I think there was some private. They went into the ballpark. Did they go into the PNC? They went into the PNC okay. park. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody. Yeah. Somebody who um, I think I knew them from Facebook or something, they were nice enough that they visited the uh, the file poll, and I think it was that day, and placed my book in front of and took a snapshot. So I still have that. That's kind of neat. <laughs> 1960. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're a good fan. You guys are. Yeah, it's, and they could be doing the video now, and they still do the audio. That's what they the last in the last uh, few, t you know, as, uh, the video came out when I think I, when was it when Bob Costas came here? Trying oh, yeah. to think how many years ago that was. So yeah, but they're still doing the audio. I mean, it's 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 def it's definitely unique. So but, yeah, how would you like to have been in? Uh, I guess it was at Heinz when uh, Michael Keaton was in the audience and you had Grote and those guys on stage. Bobby yeah. Richardson told me he was the only uh, the only Yankee there, and he said the Pirates were so cordial and so nice to him. So. Those guys seem like really class acts. Uh, Groat was another one who would have talked to me forever. And in fact, oh, yeah. when, when several of them hang, uh, we we were able to you know finish and they would hang up. Uh, a couple of them, Schofield, uh, Groat, call anytime. You know they they love the the nostalgia as, as I do and you do. Oh yes, definitely. No. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Oh, thank for, you. Thank I you. wish you. I, I thought there'd be more people on this. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, it's being taped. I'm huh, Mark. Yeah, it's um, it's being recorded and it will be on the library's uh, YouTube channel in a few days. Well, well thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank I you. Enjoy this. I learned a couple of things. Appreciate it. You're thank welcome. you. Hey, you can pass the word, and they can um, they can watch it on YouTube. Huh, Mark, sounds good. Thank yeah, you. So nice. Thank you. Thank you. It was good. It tripped down memory lane for me. Oh, sure thing, John. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Wayne. Okay, very good. Had fun. Stay enjoy yourself when you come back here. Always do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And things are opening up, so that's good. So I'll go to Kennywood. Kennywood's open. That was that line for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get your French fries. Get your French fries. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Take care, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank All you right. again. Thanks. Bye bye.